we'll be hearing a lot from the FCC in particular and uh, supported by or complemented by this, the CCC later on. Uh, the CTU has had an ongoing liaison with the FCC, mainly in fora of dealing with international telecoms and ICT policy matters at organizations like the International Telecommunication Union, the ITU, or the um, Inter-American Telecoms Commission, which is uh, the acronym for which is CTEL. And there we've dealt with them in various uh, matters related to telecoms policy and also specifically related to uh, radio communication, wireless communications uh, matters. In fact, at, it was at a meeting of CITEL last October, which was hosted in, um, in Port of Spain, uh, at which the CTU had a, a bilateral meeting with um, the FCC, who was part of the US delegation at that CITEL meeting. And we discussed areas for more, uh, maybe closer collaboration. And the idea of consumer protection was one that was raised by the FCC because they have had, um, they, they, they've had, you know, long-standing experience in dealing with uh, consumer protection matters. And they also suggested that maybe some of their recent experiences would be of relevance and, um, and use to our Caribbean audience as well. So out of that discussion, we eventually are here today to talk uh, about consumer protection matters in this, in this, uh, in this webinar. Um, to bring some Caribbean flavor to it as well, we have also brought on board the uh, CARICOM Competition Commission, which is the, as I said, the, the the CARICOM agency charged with uh, consumer protection matters or leading certainly in consumer protection matters. I'm sure there are other organizations that would some uh, would, would also be involved with uh, the CCC has, has that leading role. So um, I would finally just basically like to welcome you again. And um, I would turn the floor over now to uh, Ms. Neshe Windelsberger, who is the Deputy Chief for, in the Office of uh, International Affairs at the FCC, who would uh, introduce and say a few words on behalf of the FCC and her presenters. So, Neshe, all yours. Thank you, Nigel, um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's such an honor to be here today and uh, participate in this um, webinar to um, share with you some of FCC's main initiatives um, on the consumer protection issues. As Nigel mentioned, uh, we have longstanding collaborations with, uh, um, with the Caribbeans and CTU, specifically on the spectrum policy issues. The World Radio Conference is this year and we are coordinating through CTEL and ITU uh, with all the countries and especially Car Caribbean countries are really, really important to us. We are hoping uh, this webinar would be one of many collaborations between the between our agency, CTU, and the CARICOM uh, Co Competition Authority. Um, I am, uh, my name is Nesha Gindelsberger and uh, I work uh, at the Federal Communications Commission as uh, Deputy Chief uh, in the Office of International Affairs. Um, I Please allow me to introduce some of uh, FCC team uh, today uh, participating in this webinar. First of all, I would like to thank Carola. Uh, she is our um, regional uh, specialist director for the Americas region. Uh, so if uh, there will be any follow-up or any questions, please feel free to reach out any one of us, including Carola. Uh, but um, before long, uh, I in this presentation, we will start with uh, Christy, uh, 
and Christy is the acting chief of consumer uh, policy division at the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, she will discuss FCC's approach to combat unwanted calls, uh, better known in the US as robocalls. You may know, of, you know, one of the uh, robocalls are like our top consumer complaints area and uh, are one of the top priority for the consumer protection. So after Christy, we will have Zach. Uh, Zach uh, Champ is the deputy chief, uh, division chief uh, in the consumer policy division. And he will talk about FCC's new rules requiring broadband providers to display easy to understand labels to allow consumers to compare and do comparison shop for broadband services. Um, FCC's uh, general principle is to make sure that there is competition in the marketplace. And if there is competition, competition will regulate uh, and make sure and consumer will benefit from it. But if the consumers cannot understand what choices they might have, or there is very not an easy way to compare services, then um, you know, even if we have multiple providers in the marketplace, uh, consumer may not have the uh, ability to choose among them in an informed manner. So um, Zach will uh, explain what we have been doing in that area to empower consumers. And then I will uh, sort of uh, go back what Christy is talking about. Uh, she She's going to focus on the robocalls, but the complementary part of robocalls is uh, ID spoofing and the uh, implementation of, we call it stir and shaken framework. Uh, and then I will talk about that. With this, uh, I will ask uh, Christy, um, please, uh, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for um, having me speak. Um, Carola, if you could pull up my slide deck, I would appreciate it. While she's doing that, I will um, say what Neshe had said, which is um, I've been with the FCC for 11 years. I work in robocall and call blocking issues. But as I thank you for the slides, um, as I get started, I wanted to give you an overview of how the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau is organized. So if you could go to the first slide, please. The next slide, please. So the commission is broken into or divided into a number of different bureaus. Um, the bureau that I am in is the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Um, Carola, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, I'm going to assume that's coming and I'm going to keep talking. Um, the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau um, implements, develops and implements the Commission's consumer policies, and it serves as the um, Commission's connection to American consumers. So we really are focused on consumers and protecting consumers in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, which we refer to as CGB. So CGB then is divided into a number of divisions. Um, the first division is uh, Native American Affairs and Policies. So we have a special portion of, this, of the Bureau that deals specifically with Native issues and outreach to Native American policy issues. Another area of the of the Bureau is consumer affairs and outreach. Um, this is primarily education, consumer education, helping consumers understand um, the issues that may be impacting them, uh, outreach, so seminars, trainings, but then developing materials to, um, to help educate consumers and alert them to particular priorities of the Commission as well. We have a division on disability rights. Um, so per specializing in um, issues for the disabled and telecommunications issues for the disabled. So deaf, hard of hearing, blind, deaf, blind, telecommunications issues and equipment and services for that particular audience. We have a division on intergovernmental affairs, which specializes in, um, in reaching out to particular areas um, 
within um, other governmental areas within the United States. So within states and then localities within states so that our message and our priorities can be communicated, um, not just at a federal level, but downstream as well. Are we having a, an issue, Corolla, or do you want me to keep going? Hey, Christy, I, I'm displaying uh, the, the first um, uh, slide in which is describing what you're talking about. So I'm wondering if you can see that. I cannot see it. I, I still see slide one. Are you on slide two, which has the divisions? Yes. Yes. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to assume you're doing what I'm doing then. Thank you so much. Um, I have a different view, just um, so you know. I cannot see either. So I am also oh. not seeing in the presentation mode I'm seeing on the um slides on the side okay give me one second and let me check um it's moved now to slide two can you put it on the presentation mm -hmm. a second This always works a, a lot better before the <laughs> webinar starts. Give me one second, please. Yeah. Corolla, do you want to restart your screen? Uh, you may want to come. Okay. Oh, yeah. Could you see the uh, the first slide? I'm going to do it this way because it seems that the other way. Yeah, then that's fine. We, we are seeing the second slide now. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so no. I was, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, I was on intergovernmental affairs. So thank you. There, our next division is web and print publishing. This division produces print materials for purposes of the consumer outreach. So any of the materials that we need, we produce ourselves. It also updates our websites. Consumer policy, which is where I work, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. And then finally, consumer inquiries and complaints. And I'll speak a little bit more about that on our next slide also. So next slide, please. So consumer inquiries and complaints division. Um, this division is the access point for consumers to file a complaint with directly with the commission. So if I am as a consumer have a problem with my telephone company, if I am getting a number of um, robocalls, if I have had my access, my phone service moved without my permission, I can call or email uh, the commission directly. I can go to the commission's website and file a consumer complaint. This is an informal complaint. It's not in the court system. It's directly with the commission. Uh, the commission receives about 280,000 complaints each year directly from consumers. Some of those complaints, the commission will forward to service providers, so it will forward it on my behalf to my voice service provider or internet service provider and help um, assist in resolving that complaint. It'll be a mediator between the two informally. Others, the commission looks for trends in complaint data and considers which enforcement actions to pursue. So for example, if we see to receive a large number of complaints related to a specific type of robocall or in a particular area, the commission may, may want to investigate further and decide to um, pursue an enforcement action based off of those consumer complaint details. Next slide, please. Another division is the Consumer Policy Division. That's the division that I lead right now. This division is responsible for the development of consumer policy, um, particularly on commission-regulated entities, so common carriers, broadcast, wireless, satellite, and cable companies, as well as other entities that are subject to the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, to Can Spam Act, I'll talk more about these in a moment, and other statutes for which the commission has authority. So these are acts um, passed by our Congress, and then the division and the commission are given authority to implement these. 
We do this through rulemakings um, and orders and by commenting on proceedings that other bureaus within the commission have and are moving forward on. Um, and through this, we ensure that consumer interests are considered in all commission policy making initiatives. So for example, if the media bureau or um, the wireline competition bureau is doing something and we believe that consumers can be impact impacted or that we can represent consumer voices by commenting and giving feedback on those, we will do so. Uh, we're specifically tasked with issuing orders to resolve complaints about unauthorized charges in telecommunications providers, uh, which is slamming. Um, and then conducting rulemakings on robocalls. We do a lot of that. Um, also on slamming, truth and billing, telemarketing, and fax advertising. So looking at those lists, you can see we have um, a wide range of work that keeps us very busy. Next slide, please. Uh, as Neshe mentioned, a large part of our work is robocalls. Um, we do this in three main ways. Um, we our, our primary goal um, is to empower consumers to stop the phone calls and the text messages that reach their phones that they do not want. We do this um, under the authority in one respect of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, which is a 1991 law that Congress passed. It requires consent for calls made using two different types of technology, either an auto dialer or where the call contains a pre-recorded or artificial voice. These, this legislation was passed by our Congress in 1991, and there were really no text message services in 1991. But the, the law gives us permission at the commission to, um, to continue to interpret the, the law in light of changing technologies, which is really wonderful for us. So based off of that permission, that authority, we have construed um, the, this 1991 law, the use of the word call to include text messages as well as voice calls. So we regulate both voice calls and text messages under this, under this law. Um, and it is only, again, for calls made using certain technology, and that's auto dialers and pre-recorded or artificial voice calls. So many of, ro of the robocalls, the unwanted or the illegal robocalls that we that consumers encounter are made this way, but not all of them. Um, and so we are limited there. One of the reasons we are limited is the second bullet, which is spoofing. We regulate spoofing through the Truth in Color ID Act. Um, spoofing, as you know, is is altering the number displayed on caller ID so that it, does, it reflects a number other than the number that it's actually calling. Um, in the US, it's illegal to transmit misleading or inaccurate caller ID information, but only where the intent is to defraud or cause harm or wrongly obtain anything of value. So if you were changing that caller ID information simply to redirect the um, maybe any return calls to a main office number rather than you know the person who actually called. We see this a lot for doctor's offices, um, hospitals, things like that. An outgoing number isn't necessarily the one that needs to be the return number for consumers calling back. That type of, um, of caller ID spoofing is not illegal. And so we cannot do blanket regulations that outlaw all spoofing. So because we are limited in the regulations we can do on spoofing, and because uh, we are limited under the Telephone Com Consumer Protection Act to the type of, um, of technology used to make calls and text, the commission has now begun working on a third type of, um, of regulations to protect consumers from robocalls. And that's this third main bullet where we're trying to stop the calls from ever reaching consumers. We do this through call and text blocking regulations and we've worked closely with industry to prevent these calls from transiting the U.S. network. So if they've been initiated, we want to stop them from continuing to move along the network before they reach consumers. Next slide, please. So we do this in a number of ways. We have a multi-pronged approach to robocall mitigation. The first column on the left says that we're enhancing consumer choice. We want to give consumers choices about the calls that they receive and the amount of blocking they are subject to. But we also want to protect consumers from unlawful calls. So we've authorized blocking of unwanted calls based on reasonable analytics with consumer consent. So we've told voiceovers providers, 
you can use reasonable analytics in your networks. You can look at volume of calls from certain phone numbers, the burst of calls, how frequently they're making large volumes of calls, numbers that maybe didn't make a lot of calls earlier, but now suddenly are making huge volumes of calls, um, the duration of calls, uh, whether this is a trusted phone number in your network, all of those types of analytics um, you can use to determine whether um, whether to block those calls. And the commission hasn't uh, specified what those analytics should be. We've left that to voice service providers to determine what types of analytics they want to use with some guidelines. Um, but we've, uh, we've authorized that type of blocking with consumer consent. So I, as the consumer, would have to say, yes, I authorize you to block that type of, of um, to use analytics to block my calls. We've also authorized blocking of calls that are highly likely to be illegal without consumer consent. So providers can do this across the board on their networks. I, as a consumer, do not have to consent. These types of numbers are numbers that, calls from numbers that are absolutely illegal. So phone numbers that don't exist, um, area codes uh, that have not been created by the, the commission, <clears throat> numbers that, um, that that the owner of the number has said, we are never going to make outbound calls with this phone number. And we have a list of those numbers. Those type of calls that if a number appears from that call, from that, I'm sorry, if a call appears from that number, we know it is illegal. And so we've authorized providers to block those. Um, we've also established protections against erroneous blocking. So if a provider follows the rules and blocks calls that are absolutely are going to be illegal and gets it wrong, we've established protections so that they will not be um, they will not be prosecuted for those blocking calls that should not have been blocked. The middle column is our second area of um, of call blocking, which is identifying bad actors so that we can restore faith in caller ID. We've established caller ID authentication rules, and Nisha is going to talk a little bit more about that. That's Stir Shaken protocol, um, but we've implemented that across our voice services um, network in the United States to help build trust in the phone calls that consumers do receive. We've also established traceback requirements, um, and this is there's a lot I could go into in traceback requirements, but it it's um, it's a a system of, that requires cooperation from the voice service provider industry that helps us trace um, the origin of a phone call um, within a matter of hours rather than a matter of weeks um, if we had to serve subpoenas to get that information. Uh, we have rules requiring participation, but it is an industry-led effort. The third category is holding voice service providers responsible. So we've established rules that require um, knowing that providers know their customer, including knowing their upstream provider. Um, we've required them to block following commission notification of illegal calls. And there are, there are a lot of protections and protocols around this, but if the commission has, um, has noticed a pattern of illegal calls transiting from a certain provider, the commission will notify after we'll we'll give notice to the carrier if the carrier does not respond and stop the traffic the commission will notify all other providers to block that traffic or similar traffic from that one provider and it basically shuts down the bad actor provider it's a very powerful um and significant tool that the commission has recently started using um and we've seen great success in stopping um stopping specific types of, of calls from, from truly bad actor providers, putting, putting bad calls on the, system, on the network. And then um, the last is robocall mitigation database filing requirements. Neshe will probably talk more about this, but it's, um, it's a database that all providers must report to the commission how they are mitigating, um, how they are mitigating robocalls using stir shaken in the US phone system. That's a large picture of the types of the categories of um, call blocking that we're doing through our regulations. So next slide, please. Uh, this has been a relative, re relatively recent um, set of regulations for the commission. We started in 2017. Um, we with simply by permitting blocking based on calling number in certain instances. Um, and then because we knew that blocking calls was a very significant step, 
um, we took it slowly and we did this incrementally. So in 2019, the commission confirmed that providers may block based on reasonable analytics. In 2020, uh, we adopted a safe harbor for blocking. That's where we said, if you do this wrong, when you followed our rules, you won't be subject to an enforcement action. Um, in December of 2020, we adopted affirmative obligations for providers. We expanded that safe harbor and we enhanced transparency and redress. And what that means there is um, if I, as a caller, I, I may not know that my calls are being blocked or why they're being blocked. Um, and then the call recipient may not know that it's been blocked as well. I don't know that I'm missing calls that I was supposed that I expected. So transparency and redress says that I, as a caller, can find out why my call was being blocked, and then I can take steps to solve the problem. Transparency and redress. So that was significant protection for callers. 2020, we adopted um, several mitigation requirements, specifically for gateway providers. So the gateway is where traffic enters the U.S. network, um, and then we have intermedi intermediary providers, so it goes from a gateway to an intermediary, and then finally the terminating provider, which is the last step as it reaches the consumer. If we can stop those calls entering through the gateway, international calls entering the gateway of the U.S. system, it cuts out a lot of traffic um, that may not be the traffic we want on our system, on our network. In 2023, we expanded um, robocall mitigation requirements that had been adopted for the gateway providers just the year before and expanded those to other types of providers, intermediary providers. And then we sought comment on um, additional types of protections that we that we could take. So next slide, please. Um, this very small font, my apologies, um, gives you more information on what we did in 2022, specifics on that. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail on what those uh, gateway provider mitigation uh, requirements were. Again, those were rules to stop calls from entering the U.S. network. Um, and then the next slide, this is the 2023 the call blocking order that we just did a few months ago. So um, as we get there, there it is, the 2023 call blocking order. We had a, we extended a 24 hour traceback response requirement. So in the gateway provider, we required gateway providers to respond to traceback requests for information within 24 hours and said that all others should respond, I think, timely, in a timely manner. We extended that 24-hour traceback response requirement to all voice service providers rather than simply gateway. So now if a, if a voice service provider gets a request for traceback information, they must respond within 24 hours. Many do so much more quickly than that, but this prevents us from having kind of a log jam um, and keeps the information moving to get it back to our enforcement bureau more quickly. Because the sooner that we can get that information, the sooner we can stop a provider from making those calls, I'm sorry, can stop a caller from making the calls before they disappear. Um, many of these callers will set up a set up a, um, a scheme, make a ton of calls and then sh and then close and we can't find them if we can't get to them quickly. In 2023, we also extended the requirements to block substantially similar traffic following commission notification from gateway providers to originary to originating providers rather than simply the gateway providers. So this was what I talked about a little while ago. We have this whole system of um, notification uh, of if the commission identifies bad traffic and gives notice and it isn't shut down, then downstream providers can block off all traffic from that uh, bad actor. And then we extended the requirement to know the upstream provider, to really know who your customer is and what type of traffic, uh, what type of calls are putting on the network. We extended that to all voice service providers rather than simply the gateway providers, just putting more accountability in our system and the calls that are going there. Uh, we haven't stopped. Um, last slide. In that 2023 order, we also asked questions and I noticed a proposed rulemaking um, about what we should do next. And so these are some of the, the topics the commission is considering for a next rulemaking, should it choose to do one. Uh, we may want to require providers to offer opt-out analytics-based blocking of calls highly likely to be illegal. We have proposed to require all voice service providers rather than simply gateway providers to block based on a reasonable do not originate list. That do not originate list, <clears throat> excuse me, is 
calls that the, the call number owner has said, we're never going to make out, outbound calls from this number. It's only a receiving number. We propose to require non-gateway intermediate and terminating providers to, sublock, to block substantially similar traffic following commission notification in certain instances. Again, that's that, that system that helps us block bad traffic when it's identified. We've sought comment on requiring voice service providers to use a single specified zip code to provide immediate notification to callers that a call is blocked based on reasonable analytics. That's part of that transparency and redress system of rules. We've sought comment on whether and how to require display of caller name where a terminating provider, terminating voice service provider displays an indication that a call has received A level or full attestation. This is part of stir shaken and a very specific question um, proposal on what exactly needs to be provide, provided on the display so that consumers can trust the display name and know that it's been validated by stir shaken. And then finally, we proposed a base forfeiture for failure to take affirmative effective measures to prevent new and renewing customers from using the network to originate illegal calls. A base forfeiture is the amount of money you're going to be penalized if you're caught, if we have to shut you down, if you're caught placing bad traffic on the network. So this is um, giving the commission more power in the um, enforcement actions it takes. So I hope that was informative and wasn't terribly confusing. I find our call blocking rules um, sometimes a little overwhelming. Um, like I said, we've we've tried to go slowly and be careful in how we've done them, but still a lot of information, um, all in an effort to protect consumers and to restore trust in our in our voice service network. Um, so if there are any questions, I am looking at the chat and questions and answers. I do, I'm not seeing any, but uh, Nigel? Yes, I I have one. Thank you, um, Nishi. There was a lot of mention of gateway providers, and I'm wondering, do you, can can you say maybe what percentage of the robocalls uh, pass through a gateway provider. In other words, either originate from outside the USA coming in or originate within the USA going to some other country? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know that information. I'm very sorry. So my understanding, majority of uh, uh, calls are actually originating outside the United States. Uh, that's why it's also important for us to uh, collaborate with other countries. For example, we have a memorandum of understanding with Canada, especially Canada and US have the same North American numbering plan. Uh, so with respect to robocalls, we have a memorandum of understanding in place uh, with uh, uh, our counterparts there to collaborate and uh, both in the enforcement side and other side, um, and the VR also um, uh, looking uh, to work with uh, other countries uh, on these issues. And in terms of coming internally, uh, we do at the federal level also agreements with each state in the United States. Uh, consumer issues is not just dealt at the federal level, but each state also has their own rules and regulations. Uh, we are also on the robocall uh, contacts uh, uh, working with the states, maybe Christy, uh, it's probably your, uh, your division is, uh, your uh, Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau is uh, leading that uh, internal. But to answer your question, Nigel, majority of the calls are actually originates outside the United States, but the receiving party here, the consumer sees as if the call is coming within the United States because they are spoofing the number originating outside the United States. Right, right. Because that, that's been my experience in, in the United States. I've, you know, it, I, I, I've, I've been a recipient of, of these types of calls, but it always seems to be coming from somewhere within the US. You know, it, it, it doesn't seem to be from outside. Yeah, so, that's because they are spoofing the caller ID, and uh, that's why one of uh, these, when I'm talking about Stiren uh, Shaken protocol, that is to address exactly this issue. Uh, um, 
but you know the call is originates outside the country but the internally you think it's either a number that you recognize or a number close to the number you recognize but origination might be even you know somewhere completely uh, not even close uh, to where you live okay. uh, i see also Thanks. romel has uh, yes Hi, good morning. Sorry. Um, yeah, since we're on the issue of cooperation, and you just mentioned cooperation with uh, agencies outside of the U.S., um, I was just wondering, um, I know that the U.S. FTC is one of our, the, the primary consumer protection authority in the U.S., and so how does the work of the FCC regarding consumer protection overlap with the functions of the U.S. FTC? Uh, and what mechanisms, if, if, if any, are in place that allow for cooperations between the two agencies? Thank you. Christy, do you want to take that question or? I can, I can do, I can answer a bit. Um, we have similar jurisdiction um, and similar topics that we cover, but, but they don't overlap entirely. Um, we both have enforcement arms. We both regulate um, we both regulate robocalls, but our jurisdiction is a little broader than the Federal Communications Commission. I wasn't prepared to answer this question, and so I always get it a bit wrong. They have they have authority over a certain specific type of robocalls, and then we have authority over all robocalls. But I can't give you the specifics on what they regulate that is a portion of ours, Neshe. Yeah, so um, FTC, Federal Trade Commission, uh, does not have jurisdiction over common carriers and common ca the uh, service providers that we call it common carrier. Uh, these are voice service providers and other service providers uh, that FCC regulates. Um, but on the, uh, because we do we do not uh, classify some uh, broadband service providers uh, as uh, common carrier, we have an overlapping uh, jurisdiction with the uh, FTC, and they also have uh, they also regulate uh, consumer issues outside the telecommunication or communications or ITC uh, in, in, you know ITC related issues. So there's there uh, they, they cover almost everything to, to protect consumers. Our jurisdiction is sort of limited to the telecommunication ICT. And specifically, we have jurisdiction over what we call common carriers, and they do not. But we very closely coordinate on our consumer protection issues because ultimately we, uh, our goals are the same. Uh, and there, where our jurisdiction overlaps, we have a uh, memorandum of also understanding how we work on that. On the enforcement side, uh, we, we really work very closely with them. They also have... Um, relationships with the, each state, and each state might also have their own consumer protection uh, legislation, rules, and re regulations. We also do coordinate with each state, not just uh, at the federal level with FTC, but each state authority also. Okay, thank you, because my next question was really going to be about the, the individual states and how does the FCC navigate the state laws regarding consumer protection and telecoms within the individual states. So thank you very much. We, I, I'll i say we could probably discuss that a bit, maybe more towards the end, Rommel, when <clears throat> after you've had the chance to talk about CCC a bit, that was Mr. Rommel Hippolyte of the CARICOM Competition Commission, from whom we will hear later on in the webinar. Uh, Neshe, let me help you as well. I did see a, a question in the Q&A from Craig Nesty, who is the head of the National Telecoms Regulatory Commission in Dominica. And he was saying uh, he's, that Robocall is a big problem in the United States, but it's almost non-existent in Dominica. Can you indicate the top 10 consumer complaints on whether broadband speeds or billing issues make the top 10? If they do, do you have any policy decisions or strategies to address these complaints that you could share? I don't know if that's... Uh, yeah, I do ahead. think this, this is a great, uh, you know, lead uh, into next uh, speaker, 
but uh, in terms right. of billing, uh, the, uh, as I said, the uh, consumers need to know what's in their bill. So we have truth and in billing rules uh, that Christy, I think, very briefly mentioned. Uh, that was early on uh, we need to address because, as I said, the uh, consumer may be charged for the services that they uh, purchase, but there might be some line items in the bill that they couldn't understand what they are, and they might be, uh, and these may have, uh, uh, so we have specific rules for how the uh, bills uh, needs to be uh, clearly identify each charge and the justification of what that charge is about. So if you are interested in our truth and billing rules, we would be uh, happy to follow up uh, and send you, uh, you know, necessary documents. If you have specific questions on uh, billing issues, we can also address that in another session. But with respect to broadband uh, and how consumers know what the broadband services and how they compare uh, from one uh, carrier service pro, uh, offering from another carrier service offering, I think our next speaker, Zach, will be uh, discussing that. Should we go to the next speaker? Yeah, sure. I don't see any other questions. All right. Zach, please go ahead. Thank you, Christy. Great, thank you. Let me just share my screen here. Great. Um, so my name is Zach Champ. I'm Deputy Chief of uh, the Consumer Policy Division. Um, have the privilege of working with Christy on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, thank you to uh, the CTU and, and Nigel. Next time, we'll have to do this in Spain. That sounded like a lovely conversation. Um, so today I'm here to talk about consumer broadband labels. Um, and let's go there. So um, on your screen, you should see a somewhat low resolution version of the broadband labels uh, that we adopted um, late last year. Um, if you go to FCC.gov slash broadband labels, uh, you can get a high resolution version. We'll be sure to send that all around um, after. Um, but if you are familiar with uh, food packaging, at least in the US, um, the FDA uh, utilized uh, some of these sort of um, display standards, you know, you have broadband facts at the front, at the top, monthly price, kind of like you'd see sugar and fat and carbohydrates, um, something that consumers would be somewhat familiar with. Um, so the purpose of why we, we did this, and, and this was through a, an act of Congress, uh, was to provide accurate, simple to understand information about broadband internet access services. Uh, it helps consumers, we hope, to make informed choices before they enter into a contract or sign up for service. Um, we believe it's central to a well-functioning marketplace uh, that encourages competition innovation, low prices, and, and high quality services to make sure folks know apples to apples what folks are getting. Um, with that, it, it aids in consumer uh, comparison shopping uh, through standardized information in a clear and readily available format uh, and allows for consumers to better understand plan details prior to purchase. Um, also within the label, you'll see mentioned to something called the Affordable Connectivity program. Uh, that's a program that uh, at the, in the height of the pandemic uh, was also enacted by Congress to help to um, uh, lower the costs and barriers of entry to subscription services. So folks that qualify can get a discount on their monthly broadband services, and in some cases get a, a discounted device um, to, to access the internet. Um, so we, we asked questions about uh, how and what we should do on the broadband label in late 2022 um, or early 2022. Um, and then in, in uh, late, uh, later in the year, in November 14th, we actually put forward the order uh, and asked some additional questions. So that's sort of the, the initial timeline. Um, we were directed to go forward in this endeavor uh, by Congress. 
Um, they asked us to put forward rules not later than a year. Um, the Congress actually uh, specified that we uh, include some information about introductory rate information. Um, in the US, there's a number of uh, providers that have rates that uh, are lower upon sign up and perhaps ratchet up later in, in out years or out months. Um, they also required us to use information in the uh, label for broadband data collection, uh, a survey of where broadband is, what sort of plans are out there throughout the, the, uh, the United States, uh, and again, to make sure that uh, the evaluation is, is consistent. Um, so uh, our proposed rulemaking went out uh, earlier in 2022. Um, it asked that, uh, have our use of broadband services changed since uh, the FCC put out sort of an initial label in 2016 uh, that was not re required? Um, what sort of information would be helpful on those labels? What has changed as far as the marketplace? Um, 2016 was, was before uh, the pandemic. Uh, and so use and uh, mobility was a little bit different back then. Um, where should the labels be displayed to best inform consumers was a question we also asked. Uh, how should the commission enforce the label requirement and ensure accuracy of the label content. Um, Christy and, and, uh, mentioned some of uh, the actions of the Enforcement Bureau and, and how they uh, police our regulations and laws as far as telecom, um, making sure that the labels are consistent and uh, are not uh, putting out false or uh, misleading information is something that we want to ensure that the, uh, the enforcement arm of the, com the commission has the ability to, to look after. And we also sought comment on the implementation issues, including um, where uh, providers should be required to display the, the labels. Um, Congress also asked, and, and we, uh, we fell, followed through on putting forward some public hearings. Uh, we had three bu public hearings before we put out the, the final rules. Um, the hearings focused on uh, actual use cases of consumers um, across the country, uh, what they do uh, and what they must do so, to sort of a comparison shop without a label. And we heard from folks that were confused or had to put forward their own Excel spreadsheets of costs and, and services uh, to comparison shop and, and the burden on consumers in doing so. Um, we also had a, a hearing on uh, how the information is currently conveyed con to consumers and, and what is sort of helpful uh, in understanding information, uh, levels of understanding, accessibility issues, language issues, and the like. And then we also heard from uh, directly from other federal partners uh, like the FDA, which I mentioned at the top, was the author of the sort of the, the Food and Drug Administration's label on uh, nutrition. And we also heard from uh, the EPA that has been putting forward labels on uh, mileage and uh, has been updating their labels for uh, electric vehicles, uh, EVs, and sort of the, the ranges and battery life and charging of, of those sorts of things. So we had a good cross section from both uh, direct users, academics, um, and government entities uh, looking at what the FCC should consider uh, before we promulgate final rules um, uh, as we are leading up to that. The report and order was adopted uh, last uh, in November 17th, 2022. Um, it included broadband prices, information about introductory rights, whether there were data allowances. Um, some providers have you know, all you can eat uh, to, I guess, borrow from the FDA label. Um, unlimited plans, but others have caps, data caps, um, especially in the um, mobile space. Uh, there's sometimes data caps or reduced speeds when you, uh, when you hit a, uh, a threshold. Uh, we also had a standard of typical upload and download speeds. Um, there's a question about 
marketed download and upload speeds, uh, and, and we went with uh, typical, so what the consumer would expect to see uh, after they signed up. We also had latency metrics, uh, which we had comments uh, in the record of uh, folks that uh, are using platforms like, like Zoom, which we're on uh, this morning, uh, and what latency could mean for uh, and sign language interpreters uh, and what sort of that lag could mean. Um, so we have in the label information about latency metrics uh, and then links to other information. So the ISP's network management practices, uh, privacy policies, and as I mentioned, information where um, users or consumers can understand whether the provider they're shopping uh, and considering participates in the affordable connectivity program. Uh, and if not, uh, a link to find, find out more. So uh, along with this iteration uh, of the, the issuance of, of the label itself, we, we took the opportunity to ask additional questions. Um, so we asked about uh, uh, label format. Um, I'm sorry, it also included uh, unique identifiers. I'm still on the label itself. Um, uh, unique identifiers so that almost like a SKU, a product SKU, um, would be on the label itself, so you could cross and track across platforms. Um, requirement that accessibility be uh, built into the labels at all points of sale. Um, the labels must be in English, uh, but also if the provider markets in another language, for example, uh, Spanish or Korean, if, if they're marketing in that language, the label itself must also be in that uh, language. Um, points of sale was also something that we focused on in the label. Um, internet service providers are required to display the label at their point of sale, which we defined in uh, terms of time and location. Um, time uh, means the moment the consumer begins to investigate and compare broadband service plans available to them at their location. For example, uh, in the US, uh, we put in a zip code or a street address. And that would show the various plans that may be available to a consumer in that location that we would consider the point of sale. Um, and then we also are looking at uh, points of sale, both uh, in um, websites and other channels, such as physical retail locations uh, and over the phone. Uh, we also have a data requirement where grandfathered plans uh, are to be uh, archived and kept for up to for two years or more. Um, and so that again, a, a consumer that is going back and seeing what their existing plan is, maybe they're changing a plan, could have access to that. Um, also for uh, enforcement actions and uh, investigations, uh, there'd be a, a sort of an archive requirement uh, there. Um, and when a consumer requests a plan, uh, a, a label, uh, it should be on file for, for at least two years. Um, we also require that the label be made available to the public in a machine readable format uh, and posted on the ISP's website. Um, so we, in this, we envision both uh, the availability of screen readers, those that are uh, have vision issues uh, and use screen readers to assist in their uh, access of written online content uh, and also in a machine readable format in the uh, to provide an opportunity for third parties or other consumer uh, entities to index plans um, in a sort of comparative shopping way in, in some sort of third party website. Okay, this is the further notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, you know, when we, we put the order forward, we also had the opportunity to ask additional questions. Um, we asked additional uh, information about uh, whether uh, for accessibility and language, um, whether specific criteria should be adopted based on the web content accessibility guidelines, uh, WCAG, uh, which is an international standard for uh, published online content. Uh, whether those standards should be mandated um, in the broadband label, 
Uh, we also sought comment on whether the ISP should be required to make the label available in languages beyond those in which they market uh, directly. Um, we asked questions in pricing about whether uh, the FCC, FCC should require providers to display pricing uh, information on bundles and other discounts uh, and other variables such as location specific taxes in uh, future versions of the label. Just like introductory rates, um, you may see uh, bundled uh, services with streaming platforms or uh, uh, video platforms or uh, other uh, sort of uh, technologies. Maybe it comes with a free phone or all these different things. Um, uh, we ask questions about how to differentiate when a pr provider may be uh, offering those uh, those uh, differentiators. Um, we also uh, looked at more information on performance and cybersecurity information and sought comment on whether there are more appropriate ways to measure uh, speed and latency for the purposes of uh, labeling, uh, such as average or peak speed. Um, reliability was also something we were looking at, uh, sort of uptime and, uh, and the like in, in, the, in light of natural or otherwise uh, disasters that may affect network performance. Um, and then we also uh, sought comment on uh, some network management and privacy issues. Um, whether the link that we, we have on the label is sufficient or if other information would be more useful to a consumer at the, at the time of shopping. Uh, and then we got into more details about format issues, uh, whether uh, we should look at a, a drop down label uh, that's interactive, whether colors should be used, what would be more useful um, as we look at this label uh, in, uh, in future years and iterations. Um, we also looked at a label database, uh, whether it'd be appropriate to maintain a public database of ISP broadband labels and how such a database would be maintained. Um, so uh, that uh, comment section, that comment deadline has closed. We have, uh, you know, we have not issued uh, further action on, on the label at this point. Um, but uh, that those are the questions that we teed up when we issued the the order. As far as implementation, not to get in the weeds too much, uh, but uh, so Congress gave us a year. We met that year. Uh, we're right down to the wire, um, but we met that mandate um, from an, uh, the promulgation of the rules. Um, most providers have six months from the publication. Uh, of the rules in the Federal Register, once OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, Office of Management and Budget approves, to uh, put those rules forward. Um, so those are the larger providers. Uh, those that are smaller regional sort of providers would have 12 months, um, and then we also had a distinction that uh, providers will have 12 months to put forward that uh, machine readable uh, information. Um, as of this webinar, OMB has has not uh, approved these these rules quite yet. We're uh, we're working with them to to ensure that this is done in a uh, efficient manner. Um, but once they approve um, and then it's published, then we'd get into that six and twelve month uh, timeline. So that's that's sort of the the quick overview of the label. We're we're excited to get these into. Uh, the marketplace, uh, we think they'd be extremely helpful for consumers. Um, we, you know, thank our domestic and international partners for for sort of their um, contributions to this. I know we've had a, a few conversations like this already internationally. Folks are looking at how this is going, um, and uh, we we look forward to working with you and sharing what we learn as as we move forward. So, thank you. Thank you, Zach. Um, if I might step in here for a minute. So uh, step me through how the labels are going to work. So if I'm a consumer and I'm going to, I'm investigating who my broadband provider should be. I go to a website. 
I should be able to see labels associated with the various service packages. Is that is that is that the thinking? Yeah, I, I think you know it, it, it's really an interesting question because there's many different ways that providers market their services in the states, and so while an individual consumer may have you know one choice or five choices or, or whatever, uh, there are thousands, a couple thousand uh, providers across uh, America. And so um, what we envision is a, sort of a flexible standard where uh, where they provide the information about where they live, um, that would be mm -hmm. the trigger for where the labels are, are shown at a minimum. Um, there's nothing that says a, a provider can't use the actual labels to market before that, um, but we thought it'd be useful to make sure that consumers were getting something that sort of funneled them down into the, the information that's most useful to them. So on a telephone call, maybe they're asking your address, uh, and then uh, I think we provide a, a link over the phone or information, I mean, could be read to them from the label, um, but otherwise on an online platform, mobile or a website, um, it would be once you, you provide a little bit of information about where you'd be using the service. Okay. All right, let me stop. And um, I noticed a, a comment through a question in the chat from uh, Inrish Jatan. Not sure where Inrish is from, but um, if you can see it there, he's asking, and this is something we see here in the Caribbean. What about the network provider use of the phrase up to to protect themselves when consumers are not getting the advertised internet speed. For example, a package may be advertised as up to 200 megabits per second. However, the consumer gets a reduced speed. Yeah, you, no, that's a that's a fantastic question. We we uh mm -hmm. we thought about that one pretty pretty heavily. Um I was maybe going a little little fast there. It's not a small point. Um, there are advertised rate speeds. There are marketed speed like speeds. Um, we use the terminology typical, um, which puts the onus on on folks to sort of uh, survey what they're putting out at a at a uh, regular interval. So um, up to probably wouldn't work unless they were very, you know, they maintain those speeds um, typically, right? Um, so if you get if you got the maximum up to um wouldn't may not fit it depends on the carrier depends 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 on the network infrastructure but it is a distinct definition from advertised rate so also yeah. to supplement uh, that uh, comment uh, Zach, i uh, i think uh, you are you are displaying broadband facts label what you see on the screen is what they should be displaying in their website if then you put your email address. Basically, if you look at the speeds, the language we chose in that broadband, it says typical download speed, typical upload speeds, typical latency. They are not uh, supposed to change this language. They are not supposed to put, for example, up to such and such. It's not just they need to provide speed provided with plan in their own language. They need to provide that information in our language put in this broadband uh, label. Right. And when you say typical, was that defined somewhere? It, it, that must be the speed X percent of the time, for example. I, I'm not sure. It, how well, do I you think it, yeah, I think. Explain? We, we, there are some forms that providers have to submit to the FCC, um, and it should match sort of their network performance information that, that is submitted to the FCC elsewhere. Um, so that's sort of uh, what kind of polices that term, one of the ways that that's policed. Um, I forget the form number. Is it <laughs> Nessie may know? Yes, uh, it's we. Uh, this is this broadband facts so a complementary to also our broadband data collection for to have accurate broadband coverage maps uh, so that the consumers, for example, could go in, could come into our website and put their uh, address, and then you they will see all the uh, available both wireline. 
uh, cable or uh, fiber providers in their areas or wireless service providers in their areas with their coverage maps. And those coverage maps also include speeds and other information that we collect. Um, so uh, th those are standardized uh, collections uh, and we are improving uh, uh, every, uh, you know, every time we, we collect and we look into, into that. Uh, and uh, our websites are uh, for the on the fixed side is we already um, displayed uh, all the providers and we are updating, I believe twice a year we collect this information and update the uh, uh, broadband maps and they are not just maps they also have additional information as uh, Zach uh, uh, mentioned the uh, the technology use speeds and other other information that we think it's helpful to the consumers. Um, we also use that information for our universal service funding uh, distribution uh, uh, plans, because uh, what we want to make sure our universal service funding is allocated in the areas there is not either uh, a broadband service or the broadband service that is not a certain, uh, that providing certain level of speed. So these accurate maps also help us to make other decisions uh, to close the digital divide uh, and uh, make sure that the consumers everywhere, whether it's in the rural areas or urban areas, have uh, ability to access uh, uh, to broadband services. And and do do you verify the advertised parameters for enforcement purposes? Um, we do have a uh, uh, challenge uh, process. We call it challenge process. Anyone actually could uh, file during that. Uh, if someone says I'm providing this service in this area with these speeds, uh, we, we get uh, if someone is not receiving those speeds, they can actually challenge and let us know. Uh, they do also drive testing. Uh, there are other ways to verify. So we have uh, uh, all of those tools available to us. So you 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 more respond to consumer complaints rather than have a a routine drive so, testing mechanism. So th this information are uh, provided to us by a certification that it is, uh, you know, the provider actually comply with our rules and it is the truth. And if they mm -hmm. are somehow, they if they are reporting uh, wrongly, if it's not intentionally, they know they could be, you know, we have enforcement um, tools, including if they are, for example, wireless service providers, we can even uh, cancel their licenses. So we have, uh, their certification of truth is uh, those certifications are important and they do follow our rules and uh, we uh, do not necessarily see uh, intentional uh, misleading uh, filings with us, uh, but uh, we have also ability to uh, send people and test uh, uh, for the accuracy of those informations. Uh, usually it is uh, um, on the wireless side, you may have on the edges of the network, the speeds may be uh, different and we are still working on uh, on the uh, how we, we could uh, make sure that they can provide that um, uh, accurately uh, uh, for, uh, for us. We even tell them um, what, ki what kind of mechanism they should use on the wireless side and how they should report the speeds uh, so to make sure that we are collecting the same information from uh, various uh, different providers and in different bands. So we have right. a standardized way of collecting the information. Okay. Um, well. Nigel, yes, a question. Yes, go ahead. I've always seen upload and download speed, and I've always wondered if there's some other measure that could be used. From the point of view, what does that mean? What am I buying as a consumer? Where do you tell me I'm going to get this upload speed and this download speed? I've always personally found it a little meaningless. And I think that the providers have then been able to just basically sell consumers packages which they're overbuying. So they may only be 
doing it, um, let's say sending emails, they don't need certain up and down streams. So it's the industry seems to use upload and download speeds, but I'm just wondering if there's something that we could come up with which is really would mean something to the average man in the street. Mm -hmm. That 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 came up in the comments, um, and, and we we discussed that some. Like, so is 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 the speed enough to do, like you said, emails and web browsing, or are you doing? Uh, you know, video conferencing, or are you trying to do online gaming um, and sort of metrics and iconography for different uses? Um, I don't know. I, I think I think it's it's something that's very helpful. I think we're learning more about how consumers interpret the labels, um, but they're not they're not out in the wild yet, right? So um, hopefully, this is something where. Um, you know, we continue to get feedback. Um, one of the questions in the further notice was asking about um, consumer studies and focus groups about how folks learn and interpret information. Um, you know, even before we put these out, we learned about uh, consumer, you know, uh, reading levels and understanding and what numbers are how those are interpreted. So I think there's there's a lot to be to be uh, done here, but we, we think this is extremely helpful to put this out there, kind of make it a standard, uh, specific, um, comparative tool. Um, and I don't know, I just you know just just me speaking. I've seen like the FDA label has changed a few times. You know the the EPA label uh, had to envision a, you know type of vehicle that didn't exist before. So. Um, and then technology is always changing too. But I, I think that that was something that was discussed with with some with some focus. And uh, take your point uh, on that. Yeah. Um, I, uh, other... I... Go ahead. Go go ahead, uh, Nisha. Thank you. The other point I wanted to make um, in in the U.S., uh, some providers are actually uh, offering different level of service with different pricing points. And uh, the higher the upload and download speeds, uh, uh, they might actually, uh, some of them might have uh, um, a different pricing than the lower uh, end of uh, the uh, download and upload speeds. So the, it is download and upload, upload speed is something that they use frequently in the US. And I uh, and they are not necessarily symmetrical. Uh, they might uh, have uh, higher uh, uh, download speed versus uh, smaller uh, upload speeds because uh, if you are, for example, uh, going to be using your connectivity just uh, for video watching or other other things, download speeds are more important than you know your request for the video, which may be actually. Uh, use uh, less less speed it, it may be okay to have less speed but if we are doing video conferencing you have to have a sort of symmetrical speed to help to help uh, those type of things and i do believe uh american consumers uh, are very used to these terms uh but uh, you are right <clears throat> uh, the some explanation of what these speeds could give them as services uh, will be probably part of the uh, advertising of those prices. Uh, and as Zach said, uh, this is sort of, we are trying to convey information in a very readable fashion, a lot of information in a very um, um, limited, um, so, sort of short way, understandable way so that they can compare the prices. Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, on the uh, fixed side and mobile side, these terminologies are being used uh, for years now, at least here in the US. Right, just to compliment that, I think in the Caribbean, I, I believe I've also seen instances where service providers have related the, the upload download speeds to um, use. So like, for example, they advertise a a particular speed and say good for simple web browsing, email, and uh, higher speed say gaming and and that sort of thing. So I, I've seen that in the past. It's I can't say it's necessarily consistent, but um, I've I've seen attempts, and I think it's a good idea to um, bring it home. 
to the customers what yeah. um I think so. I think that, that would be very useful because you know, yeah. the speed thing is just the man in the street, as I think is the yeah. you know, and so that um, if, if it could be translated in a way that you know, I would be right. that. The other uh, point I wanted to make about this broadband fax, um, obviously it's uh, someone who's blind, their um, reader will read it, so, you know, the brain. But I'm wondering about what's what's done for, for persons with deaf, because um, what I've found and work we've done here in the CTU is that the people who are deaf they really can't read very well. Unfortunately, it's, it's uh, I think worldwide is a problem where the deaf learn their language, which is sign language, but they don't know to read and write language which the country in which they live in. So for instance, here in Trinidad sign language. But I've received WhatsApp messages that say problem happens with them. And I can't really decipher them because they're writing to me deaf sign language and not writing to me in English. So I can understand what you've written there, but I wonder what you would do for someone who's deaf. You know, do you have that interpreted or are they expected to be able to just understand it i i think we, we were just broadly we'd stated that the label must be accessible so i i think the um and then there's also uh, additional web standards that might be you utilized as well um but yeah that, i think that's a good question um but the the accessibility requirement is built built in Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think I'm not. I'm not certain about this, but except for if it can be written the blind, so the machine, machine readable, on the assumption that the people who are deaf can actually see it and so they can actually read it. The reality is that people can't actually read English or read Spanish, right. read French. So then there lies a bit of an issue, which I think should be taken into account. Something which you could investigate. Yes. Okay. Point taken. I think. Um, I'm looking at the time. We we are a little bit over now. Um, there is something else I wanted. I wanted to throw into the mix on this broadband labels, but I'll save it for later. Um, and probably next year you, we could get onto the third area, which is um, still shaken. Yeah, and I'm going to be uh, short. Hopefully, we'll have more time to discuss. It sounds like uh, there are uh, interests to discuss broadband issues, and we can go back to that, definitely. So I will, uh, um, maybe we can go to the next page. Um, so many of you know about FCC, but I will sort of briefly mention uh, uh, who we are and what we do, um, and then um, uh, focus on uh, caller ID authentic authentication, uh, what spoofing is and steer shaken is, uh, and our efforts to implement this protocol. Um, next slide, please. So the Federal Communications Commission is an independent US government agency, and um, we are uh, established a long time ago uh, by the Congress, and we are independent from the executive branch, uh, so basically directly responsible to Congress, and we are also separated from uh, 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 entities, uh, so basically we do not have, as the U.S. government, any uh, private telecommunications company. Uh, we do um, cover a number of things, uh, both telecommunications, broadcasting, ITC related things, but also we have consumer uh, protections uh, within our uh, mandate, um, along with uh, our, we have also not just policy making um, uh, and putting rules and regulations in place, but we also could, uh, we have the enforcement authority. So we enforce our rules. We have a huge enforcement division. Um, so our mission is to ensure that all Americans without discrimination have available a rapid, efficient, 
nationwide and worldwide wire and radio communication services with adequate facilities at reasonable charges. Um, as you can see on the mission, uh, all the reasonable charges, uh, adequate facilities, rapid, efficient, nationwide and worldwide uh, communications, these are all in benefits of consumers. And in uh, all our decisions, we need to find that the actions we are taking is in the public interest. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? Um, we, our regulatory principles and strategies focus on competition and our goal is sort of facilitate a, a regulatory environment in which market-driven industry-led innovations can thrive. Um, so we do that through technology neutrality. We are also focusing on making sure that there is regulatory certainty with flexibility out there so that we can attract innovations and investments. Um, we have uh, also on the spectrum side focus on uh, clear licensing rules. Um, we do have all of our actions are actually have been taken through a transparent uh, and light touch uh, uh, regula regulatory approach. This includes all the involvement of all stakeholders uh, uh, and we have open and transparent rulemaking processes and our decisions are sort of based on fact and data driven. Uh, can we go to next slide, please? So our goals are pursue a 100% broadband strategy. Uh, that means that everyone and everywhere in the United States should have access to broadband. Uh, we uh, also in the next five years, we are promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, and one of the main strategic goals is empowering consumers, enhancing uh, public security, uh, we also uh, advance U.S. Uh, uh, competitiveness in the global marketplace and also foster operational um, excellence uh, within the FCC. And with this background, um, we are, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, what is called caller ID and spoofing. Can we go to the next uh, slide? As Christy mentioned, um, next slide, please. Well, I um, I wait uh, the slide to move. Um, uh, the um, as Christy mentioned, uh, protecting consumers is important, and one of the important thing is consumer to be able to when their phone rings, uh, to be able to answer, and the uh, calls that they are receiving are the calls that they are uh, anticipating receiving, or are the calls that they want to receive. In the United States, we have been having, uh, you know, every time the phone calls, no one wants to really actually answer the phone because uh, they are either uh, uh, telemarketers or uh, people who are, um, who are, who they say yeah, who, uh, what they are may not be. Uh, so the, there is a technology called caller ID authentication technology. Uh, which enables subscribers to trust the caller that callers are who they are, they say they are, and reducing really the effectiveness and fraudulently spoofed calls. So what's spoofing? Spoofing is when a caller deliberately falsifies the information transmitted to your caller ID display to disguise their identity. You know, on the cell phones, you see the uh, phone uh, who's calling, and that's basically is the caller ID. And on the spoof calls, it, the call you are receiving might be a local call, but it may be actually originated someone far, far away from another country, and they are just uh, manipulating the caller ID, and and the consumers who are receiving the call may uh, may be thinking they are getting a call from their bank, but uh, in fact, it might be a uh, someone who with the criminal intent to defraud them. This technology is uh, critical to protecting everyone from scams uh, using spoof robocalls uh, because it erodes the ability of the callers to illegally spoof a caller ID, which scammers use to trick Americans into answering their phones 
um, when they shouldn't. Uh, caller ID authentication technology also allows consumers and law enforcement um, alike to more readily identify the source of the illegal robocalls and reduce their frequency and impact. Uh, scammers use uh, often use uh, neighbor spoofing. So it appears that incoming call is coming from, as I said, a local number or spoof a number from a company or even government agency that you may already know and trust. Uh, you know, you may be getting a call from uh, International Revenue uh, uh, Service, IRS, uh, and they may say, hey, you own taxes but it may actually be a spoof call uh, to defraud the consumers. Spoofing is not always illegal, as I, uh, as uh, Christy man, uh, mentioned earlier. Um, there are legitimate um, legal uses of spoofing, like uh, a doctor calls a patient uh, from his or her personal phone and uh, display the office number uh, rather than the personal phone's number. Uh, because they don't want uh, to receive on their personal phone a call back. Uh, they will have that routed through their uh, office number. Next slide, please. So the uh, steer and shaken caller ID authentication framework is an industry developed set of technical standards and protocols to authenticate caller ID information and address uh, unlawful spoofing of internet protocol networks. Um, most of you know the calls sometimes we receive uh, on our phones and e even on our um, uh, wireline uh, might be an IP based voice over IP call. So uh, the uh, this technology is addressing uh, spoofing on the internet pro protocol networks. Uh, the term comes, uh, as I said, it's an interconnected standard. The terms uh, comes from the secure telephone identity revisited, that's STIR, and signature-based handling of asserted information using token standards. Uh, the name is so long, so the short name is uh, easy to remember. Um, Stir and sh Shaken is not necessarily a drink, but in this case, uh, we have uh, we have the um, uh, authentication framework uh, uh, for the uh, um, to prevent the unlawful spoofing on internet protocol networks. Um, next slide, please. So this techno this uh, protocol uh, provides information regarding what the service provider knows to be true about the caller, and it is right to use the number. So voice service provider can use this uh, uh, stir shaken information to decide how to handle a call and what information to display to call recipient. Uh, this stir shaken attestation uh, can also help industry and law enforcement more quickly identify the originating provider and the caller. Uh, can we go to next slide? Our rules uh, require most providers to implement uh, and use stir shaking in the internet protocol portion of their networks. Um, the commission required originating and terminating providers to implement stir shaking in the IP portion of their network by June of 2021. Uh, we had at the time some exceptions. Uh, small voice providers, those who uh, with the um, 100,000 or um, fewer voice subscriber lines were giving an extension until uh, June of this year. But we uh, later shortened uh, this extension for certain small providers uh, because those were originating a large disproportionate amount of the robocalls. Um, next slide, please. This uh, last year, uh, we required gateway providers. Um, these are gateway providers means 
domestic providers that are the point of entry for foreign calls into the United States to implement a steer shaking to authenticate IP calls that carry a US number in the caller ID field. And they uh, have to do that by, uh, by the end of this month. And more, most recently, uh, the, the expanded uh, steer shaking caller ID authentication requirements to cover certain non-gate uh, gateway intermediate providers. Um, providers that have no IP portion of their network must either fully upgrade to IP and implement the framework or participate in developing non-IP solutions. Um, and we have additional information uh, in the slide about robocalls and uh, spoofing uh, for, for you to um, uh, look at if uh, you are interested. We are actually, uh, be, I think we should be able to provide these slides uh, to the participants. Uh, we can send these to the um, uh, organizers uh, so that they can distribute to the attendees. Next slide, please. Um, so steer shaking compliance will not only help ensure that voice service providers will avoid FCC robocall enforcements, but it also acts as a safe harbor against many state enforcement actions. As uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, states uh, also have consumer protection rules. So, so the, the, if uh, a provider implemented these uh, uh, protocol, steer shaking protocol, uh, this, this also acts as a safe harbor against uh, state enforcement actions. Um, we do see uh, the companies responsible for illegal robocalling and caller ID spoofing do not stop their efforts at our national borders. Um, and industry efforts uh, to combat uh, the, uh, the industry continues uh, also uh, to work with other uh, countries. Uh, and um, last July, for example, the Secure Telephony Identity Governance Authority, the industry-led effort to support the timely deployment of the steer shaken protocol and framework, and the Canada Secure Token Governance Authority signed a Memorandum of Understanding to coordinate efforts. This uh, Memorandum of Understanding covers interconnection of the um, uh, shaken systems in both the US and Canada so that the providers can more easily uh, sign calls in one country and have the signature accepted in another country. This agreement facilitates the two governance authorities to coordinate enforcement to ensure the shaken framework participants are operating within the boundaries of the standards and policies. Um, I uh, think that's all I have uh, on this issue. That's a high level uh, view, but uh, we could probably uh, go to the next session, uh, have the open conversation. Nigel, thank you. Yes, thank you, Nishi. Um, let me ask, uh, ask a question about, with, with Still Shaken, is there anything different in terms of the the call ID information delivered to the called party, or is it just, um, or is it just that they can have confidence that it's, it's an accurate, um, it's an accurate delivery of information rather than a spoofed one. So basically, um, it's a protocol, and, and that uh, verifies uh, the has a token uh, that uh, sort of uh, receiving party re uh, realizes that this is actually a legitimate phone number because it has this protocol implemented and uh, the signature is verified. So from uh, this will, if the number is a verified number and has this uh, uh, protocol and handshake, uh, they um, uh, then they will uh, be able to pro 
continue their uh, routing of that number with that uh, the num number being uh, validated. So validation of the numbers uh, is going to be important because the receiving party at the end no, uh, will have a number that's already verified throughout from the gatekeeper and others. And I'm going to turn to Christy uh, for uh, further explanation if she can help me. Yes. Thank you. Um, the commission has actually asked questions about how best or whether it should regulate the display and how best to do so. Right now, the commission has left it to industry to determine how to display to consumers um, the indication that the call has been verified. There are three levels of, att of attestation uh, for stir shaken. There's an A, B, and a C level of, attest of attestation. And um, those different levels indicate how securely that number has been attested. Um, some some providers will display when they pass through the caller ID, it will have a little green check mark next to it, and that can be an indication of, of A-level attestation, but not all providers do that. Um, some are currently able to do that only for calls that both originate and terminate on their own network. Um, so right now it's a still in development and the commission does not have standardized rules for what type of display is um, appearing for consumers. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, keeping an eye on the time, um, I think we, we ought to give the CCC an opportunity to come on and um, give the Caribbean perspective. The FCC is a federal agency, and as was mentioned, there are state agencies that also deal with consumer protection. So in an analogous way in the Caribbean, see the CARICOM Competition Commission is a, is a regional institution which of course would be interfacing with national agencies that deal with uh, consumer protection as well. So I'll introduce now Mr. Rommel Hippolyte, who's the economist at the CCC to make his presentation. Rommel, all yours. Good morning, everyone. As indicated, my name is uh, Rommel Hippolyte, and today I'll be discussing oh, yep, uh, consumer protection <laughs> in digital markets from the perspective of, of, of the CCC. Um, given a, a note that uh, we are running a little bit uh, behind, so I'll try to make the, my intervention uh, brief so that we would have some time for further discussion in the end. Um, yep, so here's the, the usual disclaimer that the views expressed in this uh, presentation do not necessarily reflect the views of the CARICOM Competition Commission and do not constitute legal or policy advice. Um, so with that out of the way, I just wanna indicate that in this particular presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the CARICOM Competition Commission or otherwise known as the CCC. Um, some of the benefits of having a regional competition um, institution that looks at with a dual mandate of competition and consumer protection. Uh, some of the work that we've done to strengthen consumer protection and some of the stuff that we're actually doing um, with, in this regard, and, and what we need for enhanced consumer protection in the region as it pertains to digital markets in general and dis digital markets uh, specifically. Yeah, so... As most of you might know, uh, the CARICOM Competition Commission uh, is an independent regional institution that was established under Chapter 8 of the Revised Treaty of Chagaramas as one of the, the, the uh, integral institution with respect to the, the implementation of the single market. Um, we have a, a mandate essentially to promote and protect fair competition within the CSME. Um, and this has various levels in terms of promotion and, and protecting because one of our main goals is really, to, our, our main aims is to, to ensure that cross-border anti-competitive business conduct do, do not, does not frustrate the implementation of the, the single market. So from what you can see here, the CCC has a dual mandate 
um, competition law where we aim to ensure that the implementation of the CSME is not frustrated by cross-border anti-competitive conduct, as I mentioned. And we also have a consumer protection mandate where we are mandated to support the member states in their efforts to promote and protect consumer welfare. And this recognizes that both competition law and consumer protection target or seek to achieve the same goal, which is the enhancement of consumer welfare, but through different mechanisms, competition being a bit more indirect in that it prescribes conduct that distorts competition, which ultimately affects consumer welfare, while consumer protection is more direct in that it deters deceptive business conduct. Um, yeah. But both mandates, they have a market surveillance component, uh, which entails the collection and dissemination of information and data, and the research and studies of markets to identify competition and consumer issues. So these market studies are really important because they allow us to go deeper or explore issues more in depth in order to identify market failures, which, um, are areas where markets are not working well for consumers um, to inform policy development for the better to better protect consumers. Um, we use these market studies as well to enforce regulations by identifying businesses that are not complying with regulations and take enforcement action where necessary to protect consumers. And of course, these market studies have a huge educational component because it they allow us to educate consumers about issues that may impact them. Mm. So what are the benefits of having the CCC as a regional institution? Well, overall, um, we play a crucial role in safeguarding consumer rights, promoting fair business practices and fostering economic growth within the region. And so being a regional institution allows us to identify trends, for instance, in anti-competitive and deceptive business conduct that harms consumers. So in reality, national competition and consumer authorities, they tend to operate in an insular manner in accordance with their national competition and consumer laws. However, being a regional institution, it allows the CCC to have a broader picture of anti-competitive and deceptive business conduct in the region, which in turn allows the CCC to to kind of identify uh, or predict the next wave of competition and consumer issues that may arise across the, re the, the region and propose the best policy responses. So for example, although consumer protection issues such as you know, dark patterns and robocalls are not prevalent in the region, by systematically monitoring the telecoms markets in the region as well as outside of the regions, we can kind of identify if such conduct uh, becomes prevalent or will become prevalent and adequately prepare or warn the member states. Um, advocacy and policy influence. Well, the CCC serves as a strong advocate for consumer interests. Uh, we actively participate in policy discussions and propose uh, reforms at the, at the regional level and international levels to ensure that competition and consumer concerns are addressed in policy policy uh, formulation. Actually, we, we, we recently had a discussion with consumer NGOs in, in St. Lucia on how to effectively um, enhance their presence as a consumer advocate within the country as well as across the region. Um, as a regional um, competition and consumer agency, we are also trying to, to ensure consistent standards. So the treaty mandates the CCC in collaboration with the relevant standard um, bodies to promote consistent standards for consumer protection across the multiple uh, jurisdictions within the region to prevent disparities in consumer rights. Um, I mentioned before the consumer awareness and educational aspect where we try to coordinate as much as we can with other um, agencies within the region so that we can promote and spread um, information about consumer welfare and consumer protection. And, as, and lastly, harmonization of laws. Uh, so a regional institution like the CCC 
we can work towards harmonizing competition and consumer protection laws um, in the member states or across the member states. And this harmonization, it simplifies compliance for businesses operating in multiple jurisdictions in the CSME and promotes a more consistent and predictable legal framework. Uh, it also helps prevent regulatory arbitrage and strengthens consumer confidence in the regional market. And you know, currently within the region, only four member states have competition law frameworks, meaning that they have enacted uh, nas national competition laws and established national competition authorities to safeguard those national competition laws. Uh, and But there, we've also realized that there's a, a lack of harmonization amongst even these few um, competition frameworks that have been established. And then from the consumer protection um, side, uh, we have like nine member states that have dedicated consumer protection laws. And like with the consumer protection laws, there, there is that lack of harmonization that we are seeing. So how have we been strengthening consumer the consumer protection framework in the region? Of course, identifying consumer issues by monitoring markets uh, and, and through our market studies. So recently we published our uh, food price report where we've been monitoring markets, the food, food markets uh, during the COVID to see how prices are tracking. And, and by doing so, it allows at the national level, member states to also have a, a baseline where they can and try to, to, to compare for, com for comparative purposes where they can compare um, food prices so that they would know if certain uh, practices are, being, uh, are taking place in their particular um, jurisdictions. And we've also recently published our market study on air passenger rights, which again, during COVID, we noticed that some um, member states uh, they had identified to us some complaints from con uh, airline customers that they were not receiving their uh, refunds. And so we, we, we looked into that particular issue and we issued, uh, we published our market studies along with any recommendations that we will have for the region and you know, how to, to enhance consumer welfare uh, as it relates to this particular industry. Uh, strengthening, we've been strengthening relationships with uh, sector regulation. Regulators, example, um, OCR. Uh, so we've had our discussions with OCR. We are in the process of trying to execute a, a cooperation agreement um, with them that would facilitate things like data sharing, et cetera, and, as well as mutual training um, between the two agencies. And we've also been looking at uh, data protection commissioners and, and trying to form a a relationship with them as well, especially as um, we know that there are a lot of issues in relation to the digital market and, and us trying to get a better handle on that particular sector. We've also been strengthening relationships with consumer NGOs. And I just mentioned how we've, we've recently um, spoken with St. Lucia and we've, we're trying to see how much support we can help them on the national and regional fronts, because it is very important that we have a, a vibrant consumer NGO, not only in, in, in at the national levels, but throughout the region. And we've been establishing relationships uh, with regional institutions, like for instance, the, the CTU, where we hope that we can um, deal with any emerging threats, just like what the um, we've just heard from our FCC counterparts. We're hoping that we can team up with the relevant regional institutions to deal with any emerging um, issues that might be raised that could arise and harm consumers. So now I just want to turn a little to the competition issues in the digital markets, because we know that since telecoms um, is the backbone you know, many competition authorities over the, 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 the recent years, um, we've, we've, we've tel telecoms is the backbone to the digital market. So, you know, over the years, many uh, authorities have been trying to understand the digital space and how companies operate within it, and how they've been using data as a, as a, 
uh, as an ad advantage, essentially. And so these agencies are usually interested in how data use usage and infringements on consumer data privacy by online companies might cause consumer detriment and distort competition in digital markets. So in digital markets, there are several consumer issues um, related to data protection and, and privacy that have gained significant attention over the recent years. And here are some, you know, a few key concerns that we, we, we are hopeful that, that we are able, we will be able to tackle um, in the next planning period um, of, of the, the CCC. So things like data breaches, you know, consumers are increasingly worried about the security of their personal information held by companies. There is um, unauthorized data collection and sharing. That is a major issue as many consumers are concerned about companies collecting their personal data without their knowledge or consent, and then sharing it with third parties, et cetera. Lack of transparency, where um, consumers often find it difficult to understand how their data is being connected, collected, sorry, and used. Um, consent issues, profiling and discrimination. And we heard about how um, the different fees associated with um, upload and download speeds, which could be used essentially to, to profile and discriminate certain users of, of data. Essentially, I mean, the competition effects of that and, and consumer effects might be ambiguous at this time, but it, it is still a reality that we that they, they could that data intensive organizations could be using data to profile and discriminate. Uh, lack of control and access, where consumers might feel that they have limited control of their personal data, inadequate security measures, and data monetization is some another issue where consumers are increasingly aware that their personal data has significant value and that they are concerned about not having a say in how their data is monetized. And looking at the telecoms um, sector and the competition and consumer issues, uh, we, we know that telecoms underpin the digital market. So it, 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 by providing the necessary infrastructure and connectivity for communication, access to digital services, et cetera. So it would be remiss of me not to, to really mention um, the, the consumer protection issues related to telecoms. So for instance, um, some consumer issues might, because telecoms you know, are a critical sector and they're, natural, they're usually natural um, monopolies, they, they, they tend to give rise to competition and consumer protection issues. So for instance, like price and cost transparency, we know that telecom operators should provide transparent pricing and billing information to consumers that are clear and accurate and you know disclosing uh, service fees and contract terms and all these essential information that consumers want however sometimes that may not be the case that is why some um, in a lot of the the, um, the 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 CSME member states we're seeing that billing is one of the main consumer protection concerns where you know people are querying their bills they don't understand how their their their, their bills are are actually um, estimated so that is a, 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 a potential issue obviously quality of service this is another thing that we're seeing also across the region uh, where telecom companies should provide reliable and high quality services to consumers um, consumer privacy and data, we already talked about that, where they should be handling um, consumer data sensitively, uh, which might not necessarily be the case. Uh, switching and portability, consumers should have the ability to switch telecom providers easily. Um, and of course, these facilitate greater competition uh, within markets, telecoms markets, but unfortunately that is not necessarily the case within the region and we're still trying to go in these, this particular direction. Um, complaint handling and dispute resolution. So we're talking about establishing effective mechanisms for consumer complaints and, and, and having a transparent and efficient process 
to address these particular consumer complaints. So I think that that is still something that we are dealing with within the region. And of course, exemptions from competition law. There are some countries that, with, that have competition law that still exempt um, the telecom sectors, like for instance, Trinidad, that might uh, exempt the telecom sector from its national competition law. And exempt, exemptions from competition law, it, it, it tend to limit the ability of competition authorities to, accept, to assess the conduct of telecom operators. So this, these are essentially some of the challenges. So what is the CCC doing in terms of digital markets specifically? Well, we've been collaborating with the Commonwealth Secretariat on data protection and privacy gaps in, in the CSME. So we've now commissioned a high level study, which is being undertaken by London Economics, which will look at a legislative review. Um, it will look at some of the, the consumer concerns that are prevalent within not only developed countries, but also hopefully developing countries as well. We're, we're planning on, this is obviously going to be the, a first step in a, a, a wider project where we are going to be trying to examine um, issues from all stakeholders so that we could determine the adequate role for competition and consumer protection law within the region. And um, what we are also really trying to engage sector regulators, uh, because we know that sector regulation and competition law, they're complements. So, uh, you know, modern international best practices uh, view them as complements. And so uh, these considerations have led the CCC to prioritize its outreach and improve relationships with sector regulators, particularly in telecoms. Um, and in this regard, We've proposed, as I mentioned before, the cooperation agreement with Oker, uh, which is still under negotiation. Uh, one of the other things that we've been doing, some of you, even uh, some of the participants in this particular webinar will be familiar with the two online courses that we've launched this year. Um, an online course on uh, introductory online courses in competition law and consumer protection in the CSME. And um, the consumer protection um, course, it actually contains a, a module on emerging trends, which looks at uh, consumer issues in digital markets. But as time go on, the intention is to really keep adding and keep building on the course because obviously emerging issues, uh, they will always keep coming. So even some of the stuff that are being um, looked at or presented here by the FCC, we might look in the near future to probably have modules on, on, on those uh, as well. And these courses are free. And, and here you can see that, you know, we've registered participants from both. Um, if we have like 120 persons doing the competition course and 84 doing the consumer protection course. And we have participants from both national consumer authorities, as well as sector regulators, both within the CSME, as well as outside of the CSME. So what is needed, you know, data and consumer complaints, you know, data is very essential and data and consumer complaints, they, it, as well as having a database to store that data is, is very important. So at the national level, there are databases to collect data, but with varying levels of consistency and harmonization. Again, that, that term coming up again. And I have to mention that there was a, a consumer protection strategy that was actually approved by Quartet. It was a strategy for 2012 to 2016, which implied that there should be a regional consumer complaints database, which would co collate all of the consumer information so that it would allow us to do things like identify patterns and trends, early detections of emerging risks. It would empower consumers where they would now have a, a, an additional platform that they can upload their complaints. So they, they would not only be able to report things nationally, but regionally as well. And we hope that with, if we can get an effective consumer complaints database operational, 
that it would encourage intra-regional uh, fair competition, as well as help with uh, regional policy development and, and advocacy. Ramel? Yeah. If I, that, um, we are just over time now, so if you could wind up quickly. And sure. I only so have two more So two that we don't delay them too much longer. Okay, sure. go ahead quickly. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of digital markets and specifically, there is some still in some information that we're still trying to, to, to capture. For instance, the level of consumer activity on the internet um, in terms of the specific usage of the internet identifying the concerns of consumers uh, while browsing the internet, uh, consumer views on data privacy and protection. So all of these are things uh, that we are trying to see if we can capture them in the next phase of the um, data protection project that we are uh, actually in, currently pursuing. And of course, we need harmonized legislation. Harmonized legislation within is, is important. Uh, fair competition in terms of um, preventing um, practices such as monopolies, et cetera. We need to have consistent competition laws uh, across the region uh, to provide legal certainty, to afford greater consumer confidence, and to, to facilitate greater collaboration between the competition um, the competition authorities as well as the, the sector regulators. Uh, and obviously it will promote greater regional uh, integration. As, and, and we also need some cooperation frameworks as well. Um, cooperation frameworks with data protection authorities. I, I mentioned CTU and, and OCR, uh, other sector regulators at the national level, as we realize that there are some constraints at the national level where sector regulators may not be able to share information with agencies outside of their jurisdiction. And we need cooperation agreements with consumer authorities. So I, in wrapping up, I just want to thank you all um, for listening. And you can feel free to contact us by email or check out our website or social media platform. You can use those particular methods of checking out what we do to look at some of the outputs that I mentioned um, previously, like the, the food price uh, report and the air transportation study. So uh, I now give thank the floor back to Nigel. Thank, thank you very much, um, Rommel. So there's a lot that we could have gotten into there. I'll just crave the indulgence of our audience for just a few extra minutes for us to just kind of wrap up what we've gone through. <clears throat> um, and maybe I can give FCC an opportunity, having heard what is on going on with the CARICOM Competition Commission and some of the things that we think are needed to maybe make some comment or um, maybe offer to assist or whatever. Neshe? Yeah, thank you um, for um, this uh, webinar. Actually, it was very interesting listening to Romel's uh, presentation. And um, um, I do understand uh, competition authority has a broader uh, mandate than um, what FCC is focusing on the consumer side. It's, uh, but uh -huh. as I mentioned, we are coordinating with other competition authorities in the US, which is FTC is one of them. And each state might have their own also um, consumer protection and other uh, related issues. With respect to our own experience, um, I did see on Romel's um, list of uh, issues that they are uh, thinking and focusing on. One was price and cost transparency. Um, I think we, uh, this was one of the very important issues early on also for us. And we did uh, go through a number of rulemakings and we have rules uh, uh, that we call it truth in billing rules uh, and a number of other uh, consumer protections associated with uh, uh, with uh, that uh, the concerns about price and cost transparency. Um, the other issue we dealt in the past, and we have a, a very um, successful working environment, is on the switching, because it's also in a real competitive environment. 
a switching if you have multiple uh, carriers uh, ability to choose from one and the other becomes very important in a healthy competitive marketplace they shouldn't be barrier to switching and number portability is seen as one of the barriers unless number portability is enabled and in the us we have both on the wireline side and wireless side and even cross from wireline to wireless or from wireless to wireline number portability is enabled in the US and we have a number of rules uh, um, about that um, you know uh, over 10 years ago maybe 15 years ago we were uh, struggling on some of these issues uh, but today uh, no U US consumers are even thinking about a second uh, with respect to taking their number with them if they go if they cut the cord in the um, you know in their wire wire line uh, phone and just have one wireless phone they could actually have their wireline number ported to their wireless phone uh, this way they they will continue to have the same calls that they used to get in their wireline calls and all friends and relatives will continue to have their numbers and um, others uh, we, we've also looked at other switching uh, related uh, issues uh, and if uh, would be helpful we would be happy to uh, focus on uh, any of these issues, uh, um, maybe in the next uh, um, interactions that we might have. Um, privacy concerns and cybersecurity concerns are things that we also share. Um, and we do have uh, ongoing work on those areas. And we'll be happy to also exchange information and learn from each other's uh, uh, actions uh, on any of those issues. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Nishi. Um, and that's the kind of uh, the discussion that we hope to foster. And um, in our ongoing uh, liaison, I think what we would, could probably do is um, create some additional opportunities for us to, to share and maybe have more informative sessions like this one. Um, in terms of our general audience, um, since we are over time, I wouldn't get the opportunity to hear from you directly, but we do have a seminar evaluation form, the link to which has been put in the chat. And I would ask if you could kindly use the form maybe to give us some feedback uh, in terms of what was good, what maybe you would have liked to see and what maybe you'd like to see in the future so that um, we can uh, tailor our future efforts to the needs of uh, of the region. Uh, we'd very much, very much appreciate hearing from you with respect to that. So do go to the chat and click on the link. And while everything is fresh in your mind, um, you can you can give us give us the feedback that would be helpful to us. So we are now at what 1210, we are 10 minutes over. So I think probably it it makes sense to uh, bring to a close our session for today. I would very much like to thank all who um, contributed, who, who made it possible, the, the our FCC counterparts, Nishi and her team, um, CCC, in particular, Mr. Romel Hippolyte, and uh, our own CTU webinar team there at the, at, at the Secretariat. Um, and thank you very much as well to all who joined us today. Um, I think the highest number I saw in terms of the, the attendees was like 64. So I, I think um, everyone who registered probably turned up and I hope that they, they found the time uh, quite useful and, and informative. Um, any comments or you all would like to leave us with, uh, Neshe or Romel? Um, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity for us to uh, collaborate on this very important issue, consumer protection. We also look forward to working uh, with you all uh, on other issues, uh, including Nigel, maybe seeing you and your uh, and many of the Caribbean countries in the next CETAL meeting for the upcoming World Radio Conference uh, proposals. Uh, uh, we are hoping that uh, as a region, we'll have a number of uh, I, uh, international, um, the proposals uh, from, from our region. Uh, 
and uh, we look forward to continue to working with you all on many of the issues of common interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Romel, anything? Yes, um, I, I just want to, I noted the point raised by Dominica that some of the issues raised by the FCC uh, are yet to surface within the region. And, and what I would like to say is that we should view these practices in the US as cautionary tales. If, if there's an economic benefit to engaging in these practices, it is likely they will soon emerge in the CSME. And so we have right. to therefore study these new business practices, learn about the various regulatory approaches to handling them, and start preparing ourselves for the likely for their likely arrival to the region. And so, a thank you to our FCC colleagues for enlightening us. And hopefully, we'll be able to engage them in the near future. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Romel. And on, on my own part, uh, I think the the consumer broadband labels is an interesting idea that we could explore further. Um, the the utilization of Appropriate language, maybe in in advertising, up to versus typical. I mean, those are things that we can consider as regulators. And um, relating the speeds to a, a consumer's experience. You know, what are the what are the appropriate uses or applications for the various uh, speed or bandwidth offerings? So uh, let me leave it there. Thanks again to everyone. And uh, we, we look forward to your feedback on the, on the form. I am told that the, the, the presentation slides will appear on the event web page, this event web page uh, shortly. And uh, we look forward to the next collaboration. Oh, and also please respond to our feedback form. Thank you all and bye-bye uh, for now. Presentation slides have been uploaded. Very good. Okay.